This video covers section 1.4, predicates and quantifiers. It's a longer video. I apologize ahead of time. Uh, you might want to watch it in two stages. Just remember where you ended off. So we've spent quite a bit of time talking about propositional logic, um, but unfortunately that's just not enough for us to deal with all of the situations that we might come across. So for instance, if we have all men are mortal and we have Socrates as a man, does it follow that Socrates is mortal? So we can't use propositional logic because we're dealing with say all men or what if it said some men, etc. So we can't represent that in propositional logic. We have to use something called predicate logic. Predicate logic uses variables, and variables are the subjects of the statement or statements. We use predicates, which is a property that a variable can have, like x is greater than 3, x would be our variable, is greater than 3 would be our predicate, and we'll talk about quantifiers in a little bit. So a propositional function is contains the variable and contains the predicate, and we use sort of a function notation for that because they are propositional functions. So P of X, and again, just like in a propositional function, I can replace X with an element of the domain. So statements involving variables such as X is less than two or X plus Y equals Z are often found in mathematical assertions, computer programs, etc., etc., And before I actually put a value in for X, those statements are neither true nor false. So the statement X is less than two has two parts. We have X, which is the variable, and then is less than two would be our predicate. It is the property that talks about what is happening with the variable. So we can then say P of X where P denotes the predicate and X denotes the variable. So once we have P of X representing X is less than two, then I can actually look at the truth values. So since P of one represents the statement, one is less than two, then P of one would be true because one actually is less than two. If I replace two, X with two, then I have the statement two is less than two, which of course is false. So again, the statement P of X is X is less than two. So we looked at the propositional function, which we called P of X. It becomes true or false. Again, as long as we're replacing the variable by a value from the domain. So domain is going to become very important to us here and we'll get to bound by quantifiers later, but it has to be in the domain. Um, so the statement P of X is said to be the value of the propositional function P at X, which we just talked about. So for example, let P of X denote X is less or greater than zero and the domain be the integers. So notice here, whenever I plug in a value, it must be from the integers, which means I couldn't say P of 2.5 since 2.5 is not an integer, it wouldn't work. But we have our propositional function P of X denotes that X is greater than zero and P is negative three means negative three is greater than zero, which is why it's false. P of zero means zero is greater than zero, which is why it's false. P of three means three is greater than zero, which is why it's true. Quite often you'll see the U. The U denotes whatever the domain is. And so in this example, U is our integers. So let's take a look at a few examples of propositional functions and notice I can use a propositional function that has more than one variable. So here my propositional function R has the variables X, Y, and Z and that is representing X plus Y equals Z and U for all three variables is the integers, which means I have to plug values in for as integers. So to find the truth value, I'm looking at R2, negative 1, 5, which essentially says 
<clears throat> that I am, well, equal sign probably is not appropriate. I'm replacing x with 2, y with negative 1, and 5 with z, z with 5. And notice I get something that is false, so this would be false. For the next one, I'm replacing x with 3, y with 4, z with 7, and this is true, and therefore that propositional function would be true. This one, I'm replacing x with x, and y with 3, and z with z, and this is not a propositional function because I need to have values plugged in as integers, and that is not what I have here. So now that we've done three practice together, I have three practice for you to do on your own. So I would like you to press pause, do all three of those questions, and then press play to see how you did. So for the first one, hopefully pretty straightforward, still not a proposition because I don't have values for x and z, so I can't say if it is true or false. For the next one, I replace x with 2, y with negative 1, and z with 3. And again, I end up with true because I am adding 1. And the last one, replace x with 3, y with 4, and z with 7. And that is not true, so that is a false value. In our last couple of chapters, we spent a long time talking about connectives, the disjunctions or the conjunctions, etc. The same ideas carry over to predicate logic. So if I have um, that P of X denotes X is greater than zero, I can find the truth values just like I did before. I'm first going to determine if P of three is true, which in this case it is, if P of negative one is true, which in this case it is not, as it is not greater than zero. And then I'm looking here at an or, and therefore this is true. Same thing for the rest of those. Um, we're really just following that same logic that we talked about before. Expressions with variables are not propositions, and therefore they don't have truth values like we looked at on the last couple of examples. So here, if I don't have something to plug in for x or for y, then they're not propositions. So this brings us to quantifiers, because if we have something like px, where we're not given that x is 3 or 7 or 22, then we can still consider that a proposition if we have a quantifier. And a quantifier is when we have words like all or some. So let's say x was all of the integers, etc. So the two most important quantifiers are um, for all, which is the symbol is the upside down A. That's the universal qu quantifier. And the exponential qualifier is there exists. And that symbol is the backwards E. So for instance, we would write for all X, PX, which tells us that P of X is true for every x in the domain. So for all x's in the domain, p of x is true. Same thing for there exist. There exists an x, p of x, tells us that p of x is true for some, at least one x in the domain. So these essentially are sent, said to bind the variables. So let's look first at the universal quantifier that is for all x, px, and again, this is how it's read. Um, and that essentially means for every x in the domain, whatever the domain is specified to be, p of x is true. So if we find an element in the domain for which p of x is false, then we call that a counterexample. And essentially we're saying that for all x, p of x is not true by counterexample. So let's look at a couple of examples. We have if p of x denotes x is greater than or equal to zero, and u being the universe is the integers, which means positive and negative whole numbers, then I can tell right away 
that I can use a counterexample of, say, negative 2. And negative 2 makes this statement not true because negative 2 is in the universe of integers. Then for all x, px is false by counterexample. Uh, in the same way, now we're looking at the same x is greater than or equal to 0. And we're saying u is the positive integers. So now we're starting at 0 and working our way up. And let's look at the lowest one. Yes, this makes the statement true. All of the other values will be higher than that, so still true. And therefore, for all x, p of x is true. If p of x denotes that x is even and u is the integers, then obviously we can come up with a counterexample because p3 or p1, etc., would be counterexamples. So just remember that the domain or whatever the domain is, is important. Let's look at a couple of examples for the universal quantifier. Suppose p of x is x squared is greater than 0, where u is all integers. Is the statement for all x, px true? So again, the domain is all integers. So is it true that whenever we square an integer, it will be greater than 0? Well, almost. But if I plug in 0, p of 0, that would be 0 squared is greater than 0, which is not true. So essentially, for all x, p of x is false by giving a counterexample. So essentially, we're thinking about this being true if for every single item I can plug in for x1 and x2 and x3, etc., everything has to be true. Next practice, what integer value or values would make for all x, p of x true if p of x is the statement x squared is less than 16. So again, we're specifying these are integer values and we're looking for the squared value to be less than 16. So we can say u is integers less than 4 but greater than negative 4 or these specific values or you could say negative 4 is less than x is less than 4 or negative 3 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 3. Those values and those values only would make that statement true. So now let's look at the exponential qualifier. There exists and remember we read that there exists Essentially, we're saying there exists an element x in the domain such that p of x. So, or there exists an x p of x. You get the idea. Again, just like we did with the universal quantifier, it is super important that we specify the domain uh, because it might affect the truth values. So let's say p of x denotes x is greater than 0 and u is the integers. Then there exists an x p x is true because there is some integer that is greater than 0. If px denotes x is less than 0 and u is the positive integers, then there exists an x, p of x is false because we can give any number that is a positive integer that is a counterexample. But again, just giving a counterexample would not necessarily prove that it's false, as it would when we were talking about for all, because I could certainly think of something up here for x is greater than 0 that's a counterexample, like negative 1. That is a counterexample. However, I'm looking for there exists. So as long as something exists, then we have proved it. If px denotes x is even and u is the integers, so I can say there exists some x, p of x is true. So again, this is different. It's okay to have p of 3, which is a counterexample, because all I need to show is p2, which is an integer that is even, that shows there exists. So again, the domain is very, very important to us. Let's look at a couple of practice for the exponential qualifiers. 
So let p of x denote the statement x plus 1 equals 2x. What is the truth value for there exists x and x, p of x, for the domain of all real numbers? So if the universe is all real numbers, then what is the truth value of there exists an x, p x? So in order for there exists that to be true, we just need something to be true. So in this case, I could subtract x from each side and get 1 equals x. And so I know that if I plug in the value of 1, then there exists an x, p of x is true, because all I need is just 1. And again, there exists, we're talking about this is true, or this is true, or this is true, etc. Suppose q of x represents x squared is less than 0, and u is all integers. Is the statement there exists an x, q of x, true or false? So essentially what we're saying in English is, is there an integer, at least one, that I could plug in for x that it would be less than or equal to 0? And in this case, nope, we're dealing with integers, and no matter what integer we put in there, if it's a negative integer, it is not less than zero. If it's a positive integer, oops, it is not less than zero. If it is zero squared, it is not less than zero, so there's no value that exists, and therefore this statement is false. There exists an x q of x is false. So again, if we are asked to prove if the statement is true or false, for all x, p of x is true when p of x is true for every single x in the domain. But if there exists an x for which it is false, then we say that the whole statement is false. For there exists an x, p of x, it's true if we can find at least one x for which p of x is true. It's false if it's false for all x's. So you can see how they're sort of opposites of one another. So here's a practice question for you to try, two in fact. So I'd like you to do both of these questions and then um, press play to see how you did. So the first part, pretty straightforward, just basic algebra. Suppose q of x is the statement x plus 4 equals 2x what value of x would make q of x true? And so we can just solve it as we normally would, subtract x from each side, and I would get x equals 4. That would make the statement true. So what are the truth values of for all x q of x? And there exists an x q of x. So q of x we know is only true when x is equal to 4. So there exists an x, q of x is true. We're not specifically given what the domain is here, but assuming the domain is all real numbers or even all integers, we can easily see that this would be false because there are so many values that I could plug in, like say 2 that would make this statement false. Therefore, it's true for there exists, but not for, for all. One last quantifier to talk about, although there are so, so many, um, but just to throw this one out there as well that you might see, um, this is the uniqueness quantifier. It's very similar to there exists, but in this case, and again, note the notation here, it means there exists a unique. There, so basically we're saying there is only one value in the universe of discourse or the domain that makes the statement true. So if p of x denotes x plus 1 equals 0 and u is the integers, we could solve that by whoops, subtracting 1 from each side and getting x is negative 1. So there's only one solution, and therefore there exists a unique x, p of x, is true. However, let's say we have p of x denotes x is greater than or equal to 0, again using u as the integers. Then we're saying, well, hey, I could plug in 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there exists plenty, but does there exist a unique? No, therefore there exists a unique x, p of x is false. And here is just another notation that we could use um, as we get more and more into all of the different things that we're going to learn about. This is a way that you might see um, there exists a unique expressed in a different way. So as we're thinking about quantifiers, and we have a domain that is finite, meaning not continuous, doesn't go on forever, etc. We can think of quantification as looping through the elements of the domain. So let's say the domain is one, two, three. I would check P of X for one, and then for two, and then for tr three. And assuming that those are all true, then for all X, P of X is true. However, if I get to one that is false, then the loop terminates and therefore it's false. So to evaluate there exists, again, we're looping through all of the elements of the domain, say one, two, three. Once we get to a point where P of X is true, then we know that there exists an, uh, an X such that P of X is true. For instance, let's say one was false, but two were true. Well, now I can stop checking because I know that there exists. If I've made it all the way through my list and none of them were true, then obviously there exists an X, P of X is false. Again, not to beat a dead horse, but you know, it's so important that you understand what the domain U is for each question that you're working on. So here's a few examples. Let's say U is the positive integers and PX is the statement X is less than two then there is a positive integer such that um, x is less than 2 because 1 is less than 2. But for all of x, p of x is false because if I could use 2, that is false. If u is the negative integers, then the statement x is less than 2 is true for both there exists an x because let's say negative one negative one is less than two and there are no values that make it false in the negative integers and therefore both there exist and for all is true if u is three four and five is the universe and p of x is a statement x is greater than two then everything's true because three, four, and five are all greater than two. But if it's less than two, then both of them are false because there does not exist one and certainly not all of them. So let's talk a little bit about the precedence or essentially like the order of operations of quantifiers. Um, we know that for all and there exists, both have higher precedence than all of the other operators. So for example, in for all x, p of x, or q x means that the for all is only on the p of x and not on the q of x. So think of those as joined together. When a quantifier is used on the variable, we say that it is bound. So the quantifier being at least three or you know at most seven or whatever. If it's not bound, it's said to be free to turn a propositional function into a proposition, we must either bound them or set them equal to a particular value. So again, in order for it to be a proposition, we either have to say, okay, we're doing P of three, or we're saying for all X, P of X, where say the universe is integers. So we must essentially assign a value or values to a propositional function in order to turn it into a proposition. Uh, here's a good example down here. In the statement there exists an x such that x plus y equals 1. x is bound by the existential qualification there exists an x but y is free because it doesn't say what y is and it doesn't bind it in any way by saying there exists or for all etc. because we don't have a value assigned to the variable. 
in section 1.3, we spent some time talking about equivalences, logical equivalences. Uh, same holds true for predicate logic. For predicate, um, predicates and quantifiers are logically equivalent uh, if and only if they have the same truth value. So the same way we did it before when we made a truth table, etc. Um, here we're not necessarily creating truth tables, but essentially we're saying using that same notation, saying they're logically equivalent. So for all x not, not s of x is equivalent, again, using that double negation law, is equivalent to for all x, s of x. Uh, page 19, or example 19, excuse me, on page 45 of your text is a great sort of a longer example of that. As we first learned about quantifiers, we did talk about this a little bit, but I just wanted to make sure that this distinction is clear. If I'm talking about a for all x, p of x, essentially I'm saying that p of 1 and p of 2 and p of 3 and depending on what the domain is, so here we're saying u consists of 1, 2, 3, but let's say u consist, consisted of the positive integers, then p of 1 and p of 2 and p of 3, etc., all the way to, you know, p of n, whatever the end point is, say all the way up to 22, well then this would be 22. All of those would have to be true for all of x, p of x to be true. Uh, similarly, if we're talking about the exponential qualifier, basically saying there exists, it has to be or p of 1 or p of 2 or p of 3, etc., 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 must be true in order for that to be true. And again, you can certainly do that for an infinite domain. You would just have to keep writing and writing and writing and utilize your ellipsis. So now that we're hopefully a little bit more familiar with quantifiers, let's talk, in, let's talk about how to negate a quantified expression or an expression that contains a quantifier. So consider for all x, j of x. Every student in your class has taken a course in Java. So j of x here is x, whoever the domain person within the domain is, has taken a course in Java, and the domain is, say, students in your class. So if we negate the original statement, we're basically saying it's not the case that every student in your class has taken Java, or there is a student in your class who has not taken Java. So symbolically, we're saying not for not all x, j of x, that means there exists some person in your class who has not taken Java. Those two things are equivalent. So again, just like when we negated a conjunction, we got the disjunction of the negations. This is sort of the same concept. We're saying if we're if not all, that means there exists some person that is not. And similarly, of course, if I have there exists an x, j of x, or there is a student in the class who has taken a course in Java, j of x would represent x has taken a course in Java, the domain, students in your class. If we negate it, we're saying it's not the case that there is a student in this class who has taken Java, or essentially every student in the class has not taken Java. And so we can say symbolically that there does not exist an x, j of x, then that is the same as saying for all of x, not j of x is true. Those two things are equivalent. This table essentially just is a nice summary of what we just talked about. So if we negate there exists, it's for all there does not exist, etc. So these are important, make sure that you understand them. Just like De Morgan's Laws, it's the same idea. We're going to use them all of the time. This is De Morgan's Law for quantifier. So let's do a little bit of practice for De Morgan's Laws for quantifiers. So we want to negate the statements, there is an honest politician and all Americans eat cheeseburgers. So again, we're just gonna use De Morgan's Law. Just like before, we're going to take a look at our original statement and we have to write it 
in this case using a quantifier, and then we're going to negate that quanti uh, quantified statement. So let h of x denote that x is honest. Then there, an, there is an honest politician is represented by there exists an x, h of x, assuming that the domain is all politicians. If I negated the there exists, it is equivalent to for all x, not h of x. So if I negate it, I'm basically saying every politician is dishonest. So for all politicians, h of x is not true, meaning they're all dishonest. Same idea for all Americans eat cheeseburgers. So if all Americans eat cheeseburgers, we could write that as a x for all x, c of x. The domain is all Americans because that is what it's given to us in the question. The negation would be not for all x, c of x, which means there exists some x such that c of x is not true. So some Americans do not eat cheeseburgers or not every American eats cheeseburgers. Now, as I've said so many times throughout this video, the domain is super important. So the way that you write the domain might change or will change the way that you're going to write um, the sentence into predicate logic. So let's say each or every student in class has taken a course in Java. Well, if you is all students in the class, that kind of takes care of this. And we're just saying all students have taken a course in, J in Java. So for all X, which means for all students in the class, for all students in the class, they have taken a course in Java. However, let's say I do not write it that way. Let's say the universe or the domain is all people. Then I have to specify that the person is in my class and also that they've taken a course in Java. So let's take a look at how we write that for all X. And then now I'm saying if s of x, which means if it is a student in my class, then they have taken a course in Java. So notice the difference between the two just based on how we restrict the domain. And another very similar example, some student in the class has taken a course in Java. Again, if you is all students in the class, we already have students in the class taken care of, and we're saying some of them have taken a course in Java. So there exists at least one student who has taken a course in Java. However, if I'm looking at all people, I have to specify they're in my class and have taken a course in Java, but I'm still using there exists because I'm saying some. So hopefully this is all sort of coming together for you. So if we look back to our Socrates example from the beginning of the slideshow today, we had all men are mortal, Socrates is a man. And again, we don't know quite enough yet to be able to come to some conclusion, but we can start getting to that point. We are saying the propositional function man denotes X is a man. The propositional function mortal x denotes x is immortal and the domain is all people. So we could say the premises is uh, premises are for all x. So for all people, if it is a man, then he is mortal. And if it is a man or if the man is Socrates, then it's a man essentially. Socrates is a man. If it is Socrates, then it is a man. Sorry, I think I did that one backwards at first. Now my conclusion, and again, we're going to find out how to do that later, but our conclusion would be if it's Socrates, then he's mortal. But we will get to that later on. Let's do a couple more practice together, and then I have some for you to try on your own. So some student in this class has visited Mexico. So remember here, we're looking at some right away. That should tell us we're using there exists as opposed to for all. 
Um, if we're dealing with students, uh, sorry, the universe of all people, obviously you could write this a little bit differently. If the universe was people in this class, it would be a little bit easier. But if not, we would say S, X, S of X denotes X is a student in this class. M of X denotes X has visited Mexico. And we're saying there's at least one person that fits both of those descriptions. So is a student in the class and has visited Mexico. Whereas this one says every student, so now right away you should be thinking we're using for all X, every single student in the class has visited Canada or Mexico. Again, this one also threw Canada in there, so now we're using C of X for Canada. So this one is a, if the student is in the class, then they have visited Mexico or Canada. And again, for all of X, every student, and then S of X saying they're a student in the class, and if they're a student in the class, then they visited both Mexico and Canada. Okay, here's a little fun for you using Flegel Snurds and Thingamabobs. I would like for you to translate each of the following using f of x is a flegal, s of x is um, x is a snerd, and t of x represents t is the thingamabob. So press pause, take a few minutes to do all six, and then press play to see how you did. So first one, everything is a flegal. So hopefully we know that means for all, for all x, f of x, f of x being x is a flegal. Nothing is a snerd, nothing, which means either one of these would be just fine. So there does not exist an x such that s of x is true, or for all x, there is no s of x that is true. So either one of those are true, that is De Morgan's law. All flegals are snerds. We're essentially saying if it's a flegal, then it's a snerd. Oops, I think I've missed my for all in front of there. Um, some flegals are thingamabobs. So again, some, there exists an X such that flegal and thingamabob. So there exists some flegal that belongs to essentially both categories. No snerd is a thing of a bob. Again, this is where we might use De Morgan's law to help us out. So we're saying this is saying it's a snerd and a thing of a bob, and we're saying nope, this does not exist. Using De Morgan's law, we can say for all, and then for all not sn not snerds or not thingamabobs. And then if any flegal is a snerd, then it is also a thingamabob. For all f of x and s of x, so that's flegals and snerds, if that's true, then it's a thingamabob. So a little bit crazy with all the crazy names, but hopefully you did okay. Here is your assignment again for sections 1.3 and 1.4. Be sure to refer to your course schedule for when it is due. Remember that odd number solutions are in the back of your textbook.